hello and welcome back to Build Stuff 2021 to the Saturn stage. We've got four more great speakers lined up for you this afternoon. And to get started straight away, I would like to welcome David Ostrowski to the stage. David, hi. And I hope I didn't do you your did. name too badly. It's good. <laughs> hello. <laughs> so I am, I'm David, as they said. Um, I'm going to talk to you about the history of big data. And uh, you don't need to be a data engineer or a scientist today to, you know, to follow along. We're actually going to uh, talk about some really cool stuff uh, and we're going to learn where a lot of the te technologies we kind of take for granted today kind of originated. And it's going to be much earlier than most people suspe suspect. Um, so um, as I said, I'm David, I'm uh, an architect at Proofpoint today, and I've been doing stuff with data uh, for most of my life. Uh, I've been in, in, in the industry for about 24 years now, which makes me pretty old. Uh, and I've seen a bunch of different data storage and data management technologies come and go and evolve. And uh, like I said, today we're gonna talk about some of those, and hopefully you'll, uh, you'll kind of figure out where a lot of the stuff you use today came from. And so, since it's a big data talk, right? There's actually officially exactly two jokes you're allowed to make at a big data talk, right? The first official big data joke is, of course, a picture of Lieutenant Data from Star Trek, uh, and a bigger picture of Lieutenant Data from Star Trek. Um, and the second official big data joke is actually a quote from a post, a Facebook post by psychologist Dan Ariely, uh, talking about how big data is like teenage sex, in which uh, everyone's talking about this, everyone thinks that everybody else is doing it and no one is particularly good at it. Um, and the, he made this post in 2013, which is more than eight years ago. And I stopped using this joke because it stopped being um, funny because uh, everyone is actually doing big data. Pretty much every company, small, large, any company is now storing and managing and, and manipulating just so much data that yeah, everyone is actually doing big data. And so I guess we're left with one official big data joke now, which is, Lieutenant Data. That's great because uh, everyone likes Star Trek. Um, and so let's talk about wh where this idea of you know big data comes from. And if you, if like me, you read a lot of technical blogs and articles about you know data and analytics and stuff, um, you kind of get this feeling that everything good has been invented in the past two years because you know someone's trying to sell you something and their product is very new. And there's usually titles like you know how big data is transforming the X industry and stuff like that. Uh, but in reality, smart companies have been doing really smart things with data for as long as we've been able to store data on computers in the first place, in the early 60s and 70s, right? And, and um, savvy companies have tried to get value out of the data they store and, you know, get as much money and value out of it as possible, um, which is, you know, well, it's kind of silly to talk about, you know, all the stuff we invented in the past two years, it's all kind of the third, fifth, 20th iteration of something that, came, that was invented in the 70s and the 80s. And we're actually going to look at a lot of it. Now, when we talk about value of big data, right, uh, what we actually want to do with it, there's a, there was a really interesting article called the Big Data Value Continuum that uh, Scott, uh, Scott Yar wrote, who was the uh, founder of VolDB. And he published this in 2013. And he talked about what is the actual value of data and how the value of data changes over time. Right, because you know any data item isn't equal to any other data item. And what he talked about, which is true today and it's been true for the past you know, 60 years as uh, we've been working with databases, is that the value of an individual data item starts very high and it decays over time, right? And, and there's a really good example. For example, the system I work on at Proofpoint is a um, security system which monitors user behavior and tries to find malicious access to, uh, to cloud accounts. And uh, the value of looking at a single uh, data item, a single event, uh, let's say a user logs in, it's very high immediately as soon as the event happens, right? Because we can look at it and we can figure out if it's a malicious access or not, and then block it quickly, right? And so the amount of value we can give to our customers if, with an individual data item is very high at first. And the longer we wait, the less value it has, right? Two days from now, no one really cares that someone uh, logged into, into a particular account. Uh, on the other hand, the value of a large amount of data in aggregate actually increases over time. The more data and the bigger time range you have to look at, the more value you can get out of aggregating data. And actually, intuitively, if you think about it, it makes a lot of sense, right? If you have um, five minutes worth of data, 
there's really not much you can get out of it in terms of trends and statistics and, and analytics and stuff like that. But you, if you have a year of all of your data collected, there are wonderful insights and you know very valuable things you can get out of it to analyze business trends and you know uh, build behavior profiles, whatever makes sense for your company, right? And so this idea that the value of the individual item decays over time, whereas the value of a lot of data increases the more data and the longer time period you have, is the driving force behind pretty much all of the technological advancement we have in the field of you know of data storage and big data processing, right? Because the the more data we can store and the more data we can query, the more value we can get out of it. And on the other side of it, the faster we can store and retrieve a specific item of data, the more value we can get out of it. And this kind of gives you the, the two kinds of technologies that have evolved in parallel over the past 50 years, right? Uh, one is the, uh, the online transactional database, which is your typical SQL databases and the NoSQL databases like Redis and Memcache and you know, Cassandra and all of those, where you store a particular item very quickly and you get it back very quickly. And on the other side, you have all of the different data storage technologies where you store a bunch of data uh, you know, for a long history of time, and then you query it, usually not interactively, although in, in recent years, there's a lot of cool technologies that let you query a lot of data very quickly. Um, and then you get uh, whatever you want to get out of it, some analytics or uh, trends or uh, machine learning uh, models, whatever you want, right? And so when you talk about how do you actually query a lot of data, what the analytics does, let's take a look at a typical analytics query, right? This is a very simple one, but in reality, I've spent the past 20 something years writing different versions of this exact query, right? We'll, we'll go through it and see what it actually does. And I suspect most people listening to this talk have spent some time writing something that's actually very similar to this, right? And, and whether you want to show some dashboards and analytics, or you want to build some reports, or even if you want to you know, build and train some statistical model, you end up doing something similar to this. And this query, what it does is essentially just takes a bunch of different data sets, joins them together, and then counts some stuff and groups it by a particular, uh, uh, particular fields. Now, this could be, for example, uh, if you're in ad tech, right, you can look at uh, impressions and your know, views and clicks on a particular ad and you want to you know, get all of the data for the ad and group it by the campaign and country and user and see how many clicks a particular user or particular region did. And if you're looking at some other domain, pretty much any business domain will have a query that's similar to this. And the thing is, this query hides a massive amount of expensive and complex processing behind it. Let's, let's look at the expensive parts of this query. The, the first very complex, very expensive part is of course count. Counting data items requires going over all of them. There, there are of course tricks and optimizations you can do with indexes and stuff like that. But ultimately, if you wanna go over you know, a billion records in a database and count how many there are, you will scan the, the whole table at least once, right? The next of course is joins. Joins are notoriously expensive and complicated. Uh, this actually assumes that you can even perform the join in the first place and that you have all your, your data in one place and it's not scattered between 50 different databases in, in an organization. Right? One of my very first jobs um, in 2001 was at Intel and we had five or six different databases where we had to bring data into one place and then join it and query it. Right? And even if you can get all your data in one place, joins are just tremendously expensive. This becomes even more expensive when you were looking at newer distributed systems uh, where you actually join across multiple machines. So you need to shuffle data around the network back and forth. So joins are really expensive and we've spent you know, 60 years of brain power optimizing the way we do joins between data sets. Next, next of course, is the grouping. Grouping by some value is actually kind of similar to shuffling data around and bucketing them. Tremendously expensive in terms of computation or money. There, it's ultimately you know, ends up being the same thing. Um, the grouping is a very complex and expensive operation, especially if you have a lot of values, high cardinality on the record you're grouping on. Uh, this becomes you know, a, a very complicated memory performance trade-off. And of course, subselecting for a particular query is also a very expensive operation. And so we've been wanting to do this or very, a version of this query on every database for the past 50 years, right? As long as we had databases, we've been doing kind of different versions of this query. And over time, a lot of different technologies came about and evolved from the need to actually execute this query quickly on a lot of data and you know, hopefully interactively and in a way that doesn't cost too much money. 
right? And so we'll talk about what are the different technologies that actually came about in the past 40 or 50 years uh, and how they look today versus you know, many decades ago that kind of solve different aspects of this query. And the first technology we want to talk about is data warehouses, right? So data warehouses are actually a very, very old idea. Um, the first mention of this idea of data warehousing was in the 1970s uh, in a bunch of academic research. And the core idea is big organizations have a lot of different databases. In the past, there used to be proprietary databases where data would be in different formats and you couldn't really cross query across all of these databases. Uh, my very first job uh, in 1996 was moving data from one proprietary database into a different proprietary database just so it could be actually joined and queried. Um, and so this is a very complex problem. And so the idea of taking all of this different data in different schemas, often unstructured, bringing it into a single database, data warehouse, and storing a long history of this data as much as you can afford, basically, uh, because in the 70s, this was you know, on mainframes. Um, and then query it uh, and get the data value we talked about at the beginning of the talk, right? Get the high value by querying a long, uh, a long tail of data. Um, that was what data warehouses were trying to solve. And of course, that was very expensive. And every single part of this query was expensive. But at the very least, it solved two of the issues. One, we could actually join across different data sets because we put them all in the same, in the same uh, place. And we could actually run this query um, in a flexible way. We could just write the query and let it run. It would run for minutes or hours or for however long it takes, but we could actually execute it and we had a lot of flexibility to do this, right? And the, even though it came out in the 70s, the first big um, uh, academic research that was published around data warehouses was this paper, which I got from uh, the academic archive by Devlin and Murphy from 1998. This is a hugely cited paper. By the way, those who aren't from, the, from academia, citations in academic papers are just like links in, in the web, right? Or retweets, essentially. More citations means your paper was very important and a lot of other papers quoted it or referred to it, right? And so this is one of the most influential papers in the you know, data warehousing data analytics space. Uh, and it was published in 1988, as you can see. Um, and it talked about the idea of a data warehouse and how to build it and you know, what sort of problems it solves. And so this has become a whole you know, group of different technologies today. Today, data warehouses are a huge industry. Uh, and it all started pretty much in the uh, mid 80s. And uh, this is one of the bigger papers that influenced it. Uh, now, the next uh, evolution in wanting to actually query a lot of data very quickly came about a bit later, about five years later, in the uh, late 80s, early 90s, and it was this idea of building an OLAP database. Now, OLAP, uh, as a term, first appeared in 1993 in a paper, this paper, uh, written by Edgar Codd. Now, though some of you may have heard of Edgar Codd, Edgar Codd is essentially the father of relational databases. In the 70s and 80s, he did a lot of the research and, and popularized, this, popularized this idea of relational databases and relational data management. He wrote what's called the 12 rules for relational database management. Uh, if you Google that, that's actually very interesting to read and figure out what, what that means. Uh, and so in 1993, Cod and, um, and Sally published this paper, which introduced this idea of an OLAP as opposed to an OLTP database. OLTP is online, is online trans, uh, transactional processing database, which is your basic database, which does transactions very quickly. And OLAP database is an online analytics processing database. It's a database that's optimized for analytics to do aggregated queries on a lot of data. And the way most OLAP systems do, uh, do that is by pre-computing aggregations. Now, Im let's imagine this scenario, which is actually very common today. We are serving ads to billions of users and we store every click or every view of an ad and we want to see how many ads have been displayed in every country in, uh, for every campaign. Now the query is going to look exactly like we saw earlier. It's going to be an analytics query that counts the number of uh, ad impressions, groups by country and campaign, right? And, and selects it for, for, for a time range. Um, and every time you execute that query, it's going to run and do all the computations all over again. It's going to be very expensive. And the more data you have, the more expensive it's going to get. 
especially if you do a join and it, you know, it, it creates a Cartesian product of a bunch of different uh, joint tables. Um, and the idea for OLAP is to take every possible combination of uh, fields you can group by, dimensions you can group by, and pre-compute the count, the aggregation in advance, and build kind of this cube where every side of the cube is one of the dimensions. And then when you query the, the data, the value, the count is already there. You can just retrieve the count. You don't need to count everything uh, every time you run the query. Um, and this is something that's in use today, and there are a lot of different technologies to do this. Uh, and of course, this kind of implies that because you have to pre-compute all the aggregations in advance, it's not something you can do in real time. And so, it, again, we see a technology that attempts to solve this very expensive analytical queries, but it tries to solve two, of the diff two other problems in that same query, which is the fact that groups and counts are very expensive. And so let's do that in advance. Uh, usually in a batch process, which goes over all the changes that have been made, pre-computes everything, and then you can have your all up cube computed and you can run some queries on it. Uh, unfortunately, it means that new data that comes in isn't actually added to your cube, right? You need to recompute the whole cube again. And if you want to group by different fields, then you have to start everything all over again. Now, um, in my second job at Intel in 2000-ish, 2001, uh, we actually built an OLAP cube that, that aggregated data from, I think, 20 different databases. It had a very complicated process, which would uh, do extract, transform, and load, ETL, from every database and combine it all into you know, one data warehouse and then compute an OLAP cube on top of it so that analysts could come in the next morning and run a bunch of business intelligence queries on top of all the data we collected. And this process worked about 50-50, right? So every given morning, you would come in and you see if the all that cube computation succeeded or failed. And if it succeeded, wonderful, you didn't have to do a lot of work. And if it failed, no one could get any work done for the rest of the day because we had to recompute and re debug the whole thing. And that was kind of, you know, every day you would come into work and figure out what we were you were doing the, the rest of the day. Uh, and of course, today it's it's much more, uh, the tools are much better and we, we can we have much better infrastructure for this. But it, the idea didn't really change. And as you can see, this paper is, really the seminal, the biggest paper in the field that introduced the idea of OLAP. And uh, you can see that it's been cited almost 300 times. It's hugely influential in academics and in the real world in the industry. Uh, now, while this was going on, right, this whole idea of actually querying a lot of data, pretty much in parallel, we've been trying to optimize databases to do the second part of the daily value chain, right, which is work quickly with individual data items and get as much value as we can from an individual item. And the problem there, of course, is that the standard relational databases, even though it's a wonderful model and it's you know, great to work with as a data model, has a lot of constraints which sharply limit performance, which is where NoSQL databases came about, right? Now, uh, I'm sure most of you have heard of NoSQL databases today. It kind of, you know, there's so many to choose from, you can have them as a service, whatever. But this idea of NoSQL came about uh, Actually, much earlier than you would expect. The first use of the word NoSQL was in 1999. Uh, this is the original web page for the first NoSQL database uh, written by uh, Carlos Trozzi. And it wasn't a NoSQL database in the sense that we think of today, which is you know, a distributed database that's not relational and then so on. Uh, he just wrote uh, a relational database and just used a different query language. And he called the database NoSQL and we still have the original page uh, you can go in there and then kind of look at the source code and, and look at what it was. But uh, the first use of the term NoSQL in the sense that we use it today, which means uh, usually non-relational distributed databases, highly available and so on, that goes back to a meetup organized by Johan Oskarsson in, 19, uh, in, in sorry, 2009. Um, now this is the original page from uh, Eventbrite that has the meetup invite. Uh, I obviously couldn't go because I was in a different country at the time. Uh, and you know, it's one of my biggest regrets that I couldn't go and, and see this meetup. Uh, but if you look at the agenda for the meetup, it reads like the A list of data technologies, right? Because you know, in the agenda, we have Jay Kerbs from LinkedIn talking about Voldemort. Jay Kerbs later went on to create Apache Kafka. And I'm sure most of you have heard of Apache Kafka. It's by far the most well known uh, event processing data bus today. And Jay Kerbs is one of the three original founders of Confluent. Uh, which is the company that uh, maintains the distribution, uh, the commercial distribution of Kafka. Uh, and then I've been actually last from Facebook talked about Apache Cassandra. Uh, 
and so on and so on. And there's a bunch of different technologies. And each one of those people and technologies in the next 12 years went on to become a big deal, right? And so this, this meetup is the first time someone actually used the word NoSQL in the context of it's a distributed database and it's not, uh, doesn't have SQL as a query language. Um, and that's, uh, that's where that term kind of proliferated from, right? Now, the idea behind NoSQL, of course, is um, to give up a bunch of the really interesting features we have with relational databases, uh, such as you know, transactions and uh, joins and, and so on, uh, but get a lot of performance in writing and querying and, or reading data uh, in return, right? And today, uh, we actually see this trend where, and we see this trend in many different domains, but there's a uh, cycle that happens in technology where some technology came, comes about and solves a problem that no one could solve before. Uh, for example, relational databases came about and solved the problem, right? But it has a lot of different restrictions and a lot of different rules that make it hard to use. And then a few years later, someone says, no, we don't want any of those rules. We want to build a new technology that solves this problem without any of the restrictions. And they build something like NoSQL, where there's no, uh, no, no schema, no relations, uh, or you can look at um, programming languages, right? Someone comes along and builds a statically typed language and that's what everyone uses. And then a few years later, someone says, no, statically typed languages are terrible. Let's build JavaScript, and which has no types and can do whatever. Right. And then, you know, it kind of a religious war happens and some people like this and some people like that. And then a few years later, someone says, well, why can't we have both, right? So with databases, now we have what's called new SQL, right? Which is distributed uh, non-relational databases, which do have transactions and do have joins and, and have a lot of the features from both SQL and NoSQL databases. Just like we have, you know, uh, languages like Python, which kind of borrow from statically typed and dynamically typed languages. And this happens over and over in technology, right? Where you have something that solves a problem that nobody could solve, but, has, but is very restricted. And then you, you remove the restrictions and have something else that lets you shoot yourself in the foot, but solve the problem better. And then eventually the technology matures and you get a much better and you know, more uh, fully featured product, right? And so th this, um, this is the, the idea behind you know, databases and how they evolve uh, from, uh, Early on in the 50s and 60s, we had databases which were not really relational. You could do whatever you want, and then the relation databases, then NoSQL, and then today you can actually pick and choose what features you want in your database or cloud service. Uh, now, while that was going on, and pretty much everything we talk about today, right, it kind of happens in parallel. There are different streams, and analytics is one stream, and databases is another. And so the analytics stream kind of naturally flows into what we know today as data lakes. Uh, and data lakes are an idea that came about in the early 2000s. Uh, and they borrow a lot of the uh, mindset of data warehouses. The, bigger, the biggest restriction of data warehouses is they were all built on top of relational systems. And they inherited a bunch of the constraints of relational systems. You had very tightly controlled schemas. And you had to have you know, very complex ETL processes to load data into it. Until someone came along and said, you know what, why don't we just put all of our data unstructured in some files and then we'll figure out how to query all, those, all of this data later, right? And uh, in 2010, James Dixon, the founder and former CTO of Pentaho, which is a BI company, uh, actually came up with this term, data lake, right? And he, he argued that um, data warehouses have all of these problems that can be solved by just using unstructured data and storing it in very cheap file storage. Now, the idea of storing data in cheap uh, flat file storage is much earlier than that. It actually came about in, a, in around 2002 uh, with the creation of the Hadoop project, right? I suspect a lot of you have heard of Hadoop, uh, but you know, real quickly, Hadoop is today at least an ecosystem of data technologies for processing just a lot of data. And uh, it, it uses um, distributed highly uh, available and cheap file storage to store a bunch of data in an unformatted uh, format, just zipped files, right? And sometimes you can do tricks with it, but basically just very large files. And then it brute force computes queries over all of those files in different ways, which we'll touch upon in just a bit. Uh, but the idea for Hadoop actually came about in 2002, where two engineers, uh, Doug Cutting, uh, who also then uh, went on to create uh, Couchbase, which is an insert NoSQL database, and Mike Caffarella, 
we're working on something called the Apache Notch project. Now, the Apache Notch project is an open source project which still exists today. It's a web crawler. It's a system that lets you index web pages. Um, and at the time, they were trying to get Apache Notch to index uh, and uh, actually clone an index one billion pages. Now, today, when I say one billion things, it probably doesn't sound too impressive, right? For example, the system I work at Proofpoint, you know, indexes and stores one billion items in less than one day, right? We have you know, a lot of traffic. And you can look at, uh, you know, even smaller companies, startups, they deal with, you know, these kind of data volumes routinely. But in 2002, the idea of actually crawling and storing one billion web pages was incredible, right? At the time, they computed how much they would have to uh, pay for a system which, will, which can actually store and uh, crawl a billion pages uh, using existing technology. And it was something like half a million dollars and $30,000 in maintenance costs every month, right? And so they started thinking of how they can actually re rethink the whole paradigm of storing data and, and crawling it and querying it to make it cheaper or you know, reduce the compute amount. And at the time, there were two developments, two major developments that came out of Google, which kind of jump-started this whole idea of you know, storing big data in large files and querying it uh, by running uh, by brute force querying it. And that's two uh, research papers that came out of Google. They're actually uh, very famous. I encourage you to at least read the abstract because they're very interesting. The first is, the, uh, is a paper about the Google file system. Um, it's a white paper that Google published in 2003 and talks about how they store data in their file system, which is a uh, distributed, highly available system that runs on just cheap commodity hardware, right? Just basically hard drives you could buy at your local store instead of, you know, buying mainframes and very expensive redundant arrays of disks, right? And, and the next year in 2004, another paper uh, came from Google called MapReduce, Simplified Data, data Processing on Large Clusters which talked about this MapReduce algorithm, which at the time was completely revolutionary and talked about how you can process data um, in a distributed way to actually take a computational data. For example, let's count all the words in the file, right? Which is a trivial example. Uh, but if the file is 50 petabytes, you can't really do this in one machine, right? You have to actually somehow distribute this work between a lot of different nodes and then re-aggregate them and then collect all the results and then re-aggregate those some, some more. And this idea was amazing. That's what Google were doing with a lot of their web crawling. And so Doug Cutting and Mike Caffarella took these two papers and said, okay, we're gonna take this and build an open source system which combines these two ideas. And that's how they built a system which later they called Hadoop. Hadoop is the name of Doug's, the toy elephant that belonged to Doug's two-year-old son. And he just picked it because it's a unique word and it had no search result at the time. I was gonna say Google search results, but Google wasn't really that big. I think it had no Alta Vista and Yahoo search results at the time, right? And that's why he picked it and it was a yellow elephant and that's why the logo is a yellow elephant, right? And so uh, in 2005, they completely rebuilt Apache Notch using these two technologies um, and ran it on a cluster of you know, several dozens of machines uh, and actually managed to index 1 billion pages. And in 2006, that joined Yahoo uh, and, and took the Apache Notch project with him to Yahoo to uh, use it in their search engine. Um, and at Yahoo, they formed a new open source project. They called it Hadoop. Uh, and they released the first uh, initial version of Yahoo, of, sorry, of Apache Hadoop in 2007, right? Uh, and in 2008, it became an official Apache Foundation open source project. And they demonstrated this, um, this system running on a 4,000 node cluster, which was completely unheard of at the time, right? And so uh, after a while, uh, Doug left Yahoo and then Cloud joined Cloudera, which is the biggest uh, Hadoop distribution today, right? And as of, uh, I think, December of 2011, Hadoop uh, official version 1.0 was released. And later on, uh, Hadoop and this idea of distributed processing spawned a whole ecosystem of different products, all right? Because Around that time, a lot of big companies, right, like Yahoo and Facebook and Google and, and uh, LinkedIn and a bunch of others, were kind of trying to solve more or less the same problem, which is how do you take a bunch of data, store it cheaply, and then query it and run analytics on top of it, right? And this idea of actually storing the data separately from your query engine, right, which is taking this idea of data warehouse and breaking it into two. You put the data in one place, you put the database engine in a different place, and then you 
forget the indexes, forget all that stuff. You just pay to brute force run over all of your data uh, with some kind of compute algorithm. And over time, we had better and better versions of uh, what Hadoop does, which is the MapReduce algorithm. Uh, eventually, it was kind of superseded by Apache Spark, which I suspect a lot of you have heard of. Um, and around the same time, Facebook uh, created Presto, which is another distributed query engine, which turns over uh, flat data files, um, and Flink and Storm and a few others. Um, now today, pretty much all of those products, and or rather their second and third generation successors are very widely used in pretty much all data applications, right? And pretty much every public cloud today offers some kind of managed version of one of these products. For example, if you go to um, AWS, you can have uh, your managed Spark with EMR, you can have your managed Presto with Athena, um, and every cloud provider today offers some kind of managed version of some of these products because they're just so really uh, useful and used by everybody. Um, and that, that takes care of, again, the, the large aggregation side of the equation. But then a few people came along and said, okay, well, what if we want to do the left side of the data value continuum, which is doing something quickly with individual items of data, but just on a whole lot of data, right? What if we have a huge stream of data coming in and we want to do something with it very quickly as soon as it comes in. And then later we can store it and do all the, you know, the big data aggregation and all that stuff as well, which means we want to extract data, uh, extract value from data twice. We want to get as much value out of data as soon as it comes in. And then eventually we want to get more value out of data uh, once we store it and process that node and so on. Uh, and this is, by the way, the reason why, uh, so I've worked as a consultant in you know, the big data field for a long time, and I've seen a bunch of different architectures and there's a very odd familiarity when you go to a new company. The data architecture of most companies looks very similar. Uh, even though they do completely different things with, with their product, right? One could be an ad uh, serving platform and another one could be a security platform or some uh, whatever, so any data or insurance company, their data infrastructure architecture will oftentimes look very similar. They're gonna have some kind of system which processes data in real time as a stream and then archives it into some kind of flat file storage. Today, it's, it would be usually S3 on Amazon or you know, uh, Azure files or Google storage or something. And then some kind of big data processing system running analytics on top of this data and eventually combining the real-time stuff with the batch stuff, right? And the reason why it is, is simple economics, right? If you wanna get the maximum amount of use out of your data, you build a system which does both the real-time side to get data value immediately and you can build a system that does the batch side to get as much data value out of it um, eventually. And so the architecture tends to look very similar, although the specific uh, technologies they use is, is different, right? And so let's talk about this real-time stream, right? Which is uh, something that's called stream processing. And stream processing is actually a very old concept. The original idea of stream processing came from what's called active databases. Now, if you remember, there used to be a thing called triggers in databases, which today are kind of an anti-pattern. If you find yourself using triggers in a, in a SQL database, something is probably not, not okay, right? You, you really shouldn't. But at the time when we invented, like 30 years ago, when we invented triggers, which means running some user code in response to changing something in a database, that was, that was just an amazing thing, right? And, and so triggers eventually morphed into change data streams where you can actually take all the changes that, that happen in a database in real time and do something in response to them. And eventually that morphed into what we know as stream processing, which, stream processing, which is taking events or changes to data as, as they come in in real time and running some user code in response to that, right? And one of the first uh, stream systems, the stream processing frameworks, uh, is something called Telegraph CQ. It was built around 2003 on top of Postgres SQL, uh, right? So they built this framework on top of the Postgres database. Uh, and in the early 2000s, the stream processing uh, world kind of split into two different uh, parts. One side was just pure stream processing, pure stream processing, which is taking data uh, events one at a time and running some computation on each one. And the second is called complex event processing, which is um, building systems that look for patterns in a stream of events. Think, for example, of some kind of insurance fraud system where you can you look at a stream of events and you try to find sequences of events which match a particular pattern. For example, someone filing an insurance claim 
um, two days after a, uh, you know, a police report was filed on their property and the fire uh, a fire alarm was heard on their, on their system, right? So someone set fire to their house and they filed an insurance claim later, right? So basically looking for patterns in the stream of data. Um, and so complex event processing uh, was mostly driven by uh, academic research and it found a lot of uses in the real world in insurance and finance uh, applications um, and the very first system i could find at least that was like an actual implementation of a complex event processing system uh, is something called the rapid project from stanford this is the original page i took this screenshot last week it still exists in its early 2000 internet design glory uh, with the obviously with the background um, and the funds um, and so this is one of the very first complex event processing uh, project that I could actually find. Uh, and doesn't really do anything anymore, no one's using it, but it was a very cool piece of history. Um, and the second part of this, uh, of this idea of stream processing was what we know today as distributed stream processing, which is taking a stream of data and running some computation on it in real time. So you remember the analytics query we had at the start of the talk? We can see, actually see it right now. Now imagine if we wanted to run this query, but instead of doing it on a year of data, uh, going back a year from now, we want to run it in real time and just continuously compute it on a stream of data. And that's the idea behind stream processing, right? The, the idea of instead of running your big data query on all of the data you collected, let's run it all the time and just get the latest results all the time, you know, whatever you want. And so that was the subject of a lot of academic research this, the Aurora project, was a collaboration between three universities, Brandeis, Brown, and MIT. And this is the first project that, that actually created a proper distributed stream processing framework that I could find. Uh, this was created in 2005. Um, it, it didn't, it, they tried to find a commercial application for it, and didn't, it didn't really take off. Um, the same team actually then built a, a next version of this called Borealis in 2007 or 8. Uh, and that also didn't really take off because the economics at the time didn't really support it. There was no strong economic need in the industry to do this. And it wasn't until about 2011 that actual commercial products and you know, real world industry products came about that did the same thing. And in 2011, uh, which was a huge year for data streaming, three of the most important products uh, that we use today for, uh, for stream processing actually happened more or less within the same six months, right? In January of 2011, uh, the initial version of Apache Kafka uh, was released. And then in May, the version 1.0 of, of Apache Flink was released. And in September, the same year, Apache Storm was released. And those three technologies form kind of the, the original, the OG trio of stream processing, right? Kafka, everyone knows today, Kafka is uh, you know, used by as the, the basic data uh, event bus for many applications. Storm kind of fell out of use. It was replaced by a bunch of other systems that systems like Heron that Twitter wrote to themselves. And Flink uh, was very popular for a long time. And I think one of the big Chinese search engines bought them, the company that maintains Flink, either uh, Alibaba or Baidu, one of those. And so they actually, they purchased the company which was maintaining a Apache Flink. It's still an open source project. It's still widely used. Uh, because you know, the same company keeps investing in a lot of effort, right? And so the stream, stream frameworks kind of exploded more or less at the same time as cloud data warehousing you know, and Hadoop system exploded. And they, it coincides, it's not a coincidence that, that streaming uh, frameworks proliferated more or less within the same year that uh, big data frameworks like Hadoop proliferated because they answered two sides of the same economic need which is take a lot of data, get a bunch of value of it in real time and get them and some, then get some more value out of it in, uh, in batch processing later, right? Um, that brings us of course to the uh, cloud data warehouses, right? Because if you think of the next evolution of, okay, so we had data warehouses since the eighties, we have big data processing systems like Hadoop since the early 2000s, but the amount of data we need to store and query keeps increasing, right? And then the number of companies which just have a lot of engineering muscle to invest into this keeps increasing, right? Uh, and uh, it's usually it's a lot of the same companies, Google, Facebook, and LinkedIn, Microsoft, and so on, which build a lot of these new tools, which solves a problem for themselves that nobody could solve before, 
then they open source those tools and the industry kind of picks them up and uh, adopts them and they uh, go through a bunch of changes. And, uh, and then eventually some big cloud, uh, cloud provider like Amazon picks them up and uh, offers a managed version. So if you look at the timeline, right, in the 80s, we had the data warehouses. In the early 2000s, 2010, a bunch of uh, big data query systems came about, like um, Hive uh, that came out of Hadoop, and Presto that Facebook built for themselves in 2012, and BigQuery, uh, which is a system that Google built for themselves on top of Gremlin which is their internal uh, tool for big data queries. Uh, and then in 2015-ish, most of those have become very popular open source projects. Uh, a lot of the early adopters use them. And then in the last four or five years, pretty much every major cloud provider picked up one of those projects and offered it as, as a platform, right? as a service to, to the rest of us. And now if you want to use, what's a, well, if you want to use BigQuery, you go to Google Cloud and you can have it as a service. If you want to use Presto, which is uh, the query engine Facebook for themselves, if you want to use it for, for yourself, you go to Amazon and they have a service called Athena, which is just a thin wrapper on top of uh, Presto. Um, and today it's become pretty much commodity. All these big data tools and, and the economics of it make sense, right? Because the kind of companies today that have a lot of data and want to run queries on it and want to run analytics on top of it, don't have the engineering manpower to build a new tool for themselves. And so they want to actually just buy something that someone else built for them on top of the existing tools and just use it in, and pay for as much uh, as much of it as they use. Which is why the next step, of course, is just starting to use big data tools as a service, right? Serverless big data tools as opposed to running them yourself, right? And so a lot of companies today have built these data, massive data lakes uh, where they store a bunch of data uh, and they query it. And the bigger the company, the bigger the data lake and the more complicated it becomes. For example, you know, Proofpoint is a company of 4,000 uh, employees who have 2,000 engineers and 20-ish you know, products. Uh, in each product has a bunch of data it wants to share with other products. Uh, and so initially what we wanted to build, or what we had is a very big data lake, which is something that one team maintains and everybody puts their data into the data lake and it becomes a data swamp very quickly because nobody can you know, find the data as they actually want. And so the next paradigm that's going to come in the next two or three years is moving away from these cloud big data lakes where, where you just put your data in one place and moving towards this concept of what's called a data mesh, which is an idea that actually came about from microservices. Instead of taking one giant data warehouse, or one giant data lake, putting all your data into it, Let's break apart our data infrastructure into micro data lakes, the same way we did with monolith and microservices. And so we'll build a lot of very small data lakes and we'll look at them as kind of microservices. They have one data set and, and that data set has one contract that it offers and one team owns this little data lake-ish thing, data puddle. And then we tie them all together into a mesh of data lakes. And that's going to be probably the next big paradigm shift in the world of big data. And we're not talking about history anymore. We're talking about, you know, my guess for the future, but I figured it would be a nice something to end up. And so as I talked about, just to sum up real quick, uh, we talked about how most of the, the big data, data technologies we use today kind of actually came about from research in the early 80s and 90s, became academic projects in the 2000s, and then was, were adopted by you know, initially the big companies in the 2000-2010 framework, and then kind of became mainstream uh, tools that everybody can use today with, from big cloud providers or for themselves in the last five or so years. So with that, I hope you found something useful in this talk. Uh, we can have some questions or just you know, chat a little bit. And uh, if you want to leave now, that's great. Enjoy the rest of the conference have an, and have a great day. Hey, thank you. That was really cool. And um, looking back over my career, I started in the mid 90s with development. And some of the things that you were talking about really triggered me for the experiences that I had back in uh, 2000, 2001. I was writing a marketing system. And exactly what you said, trying to get data out of that database to show trends and things like that. <laughs> 
it was a nightmare. We had so many compl people complaining about the time that it took because of the sheer amount of processing that went on there. And we actually started to look at SQL Server cubes, OLAP cubes, in order to try and get that data out. Unfortunately, the dot-com bust came in around that time as well, so I never managed to see that one through to uh, fruition. Yeah. But it was a fantastic walk down, uh, down memory lane for me. And yeah. an awful lot of cool stuff there as well from stuff that's happened later in my career that I've just seen from the sidelines. And it's really nice to get a little bit deeper uh, insight into it. Excellent. Um, I don't have any questions because uh, I don't see the chat. No, there's, there's no questions in the chat. Uh, we're about out of time as well. Are you able to drop into the Q&A Zoom link if somebody wants to actually have a chat with you? Yeah, I'll figure out how to do that in a sec. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, in which case, if you can drop into then speak to people and for the audience at home and in the cinema in Lithuania, we're going to have another, I believe, 20 minute break now before we bring on our next speaker. So I will see you then. Thank you, everybody.